Writer's Block, episode 12, actually writing comics part one, brought to you by VIP, the number two selling luxury porta potty in the American Southwest. I am Rylan Grant, screenwriter, Ringo Award winning creator of fine comics like Aberrant, Banjax, and The Peacekeepers. The other voice in the dark, the man in the box to the left is. David Avalone, comic book writer and uh, general film reprobate. Uh, and your co-host for this evening's entertainment. Nicely done. If you missed our last episode, our uh, lettering discussion with Chew creator and uh, Batman scribe John Lehman and former DC staff letterer Taylor Esposito, I strongly suggest you back it on up and check that out. However, we have a great show for you today. Avalone, uh, go ahead and bring the guests on, huh? Ladies and gentlemen, Alex Segura. I hope I hey, pronounced everybody. that right. Alex Segura. Yes, you did. Yes. And Nancy Collins, ladies and gentlemen. Well, Nancy, tell us a little bit about yourself, if you would. Oh, God. Um, I'm a um, novelist and a comic book writer. And I also am slowly branching out into being a screenwriter, too, nice. uh, hopefully. And um, I have been doing uh, these things for the better part of 30 years now. Uh, I, it, when it comes to comics, I am and was the only female writer on the DC's Swamp Thing series. And I was, I was the writer for two years. I was nominated for an Eisner, um, for my work on the series. And they just, uh, released my entire run, uh, in omnibus format, uh, this year, a, uh, just in time for, um, uh, the lockdown and all the comic book stores to go uh, out of business. Nice. <laughs> so, uh, but it I is mean. available uh, through through Amazon, and uh, and as a novelist, um, I've been writing. I've got about twenty five novels, short story collections in my name. Um, uh, I was um, best known for my Sonya Blue series mm -hmm. of. Uh, about a female punk vampire slash vampire slayer. She has issues. And uh, that was uh, won the uh, Bram Stoker Award for that and um, and the British Fantasy Award. And um, I accidentally invented urban fantasy with that book. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know whether to, to, to take credit or blame. And, um, uh, and I've done a lot of work off and on and right now in, uh, in in the industry since then since 1988 89 and uh, right now I'm kind of uh, slogging away in the uh, indie uh, realms uh, and I do have some things that are percolating right now one of which I'm not allowed to talk about sure a common thing <laughs> before yeah, we get to Alex happens. I would say that the COVID timing thing the trade oh paperback of my first creator-owned thing was supposed to come out April 29th of 2020. And when th you, we, we, of course, decided to not do that, and uh, <laughs> we reached out to Diamond and said, so should we fulfill these orders we got for this? And they were like, not all of those stores still exist. So you would be yeah. literally throwing them off a cliff. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Alex, tell us a little bit about yourself. Hey, how's it going? Well, thanks for having me, first off. Uh, I'm a novelist. I write novels, comic books, podcasts, uh, publishing exec. I'm the co-president at Archie Comics. Um, novels, my last novel was a Star Wars novel, Poe Dameron Freefall, which also came out during this pandemic year in August. Uh, I think the Star Wars aspect helped it. You know, it's a challenge. <laughs> it would be challenging no matter what, but it was. Uh, I think it, it got some good buzz. And in terms of comics, I wrote a, a noir superhero story for Comicsology originals called the black ghost, which, um, was well received. I've written a ton of Archie comics, Archie meets kiss, Archie meets Ramones, the Archie's <laughs> ongoing book. And, uh, just been a part of Archie for the last almost on and off for the last decade. Um, and my next novel secret identity, which is a comic book noir is coming from Flatiron Um, nice. soon, soonish. I don't know how I didn't know about Archie and the Ramones that I have to. <laughs> yeah, yeah, check it out. I, think I saw that, but I thought it was a joke. 
<laughs> it is a joke, but it's it's, it's a real a real joke. <laughs> yeah, well, then you know my friend Franco Francovilla. Yes. Oh great. yes, we love we love Franco Villa. Francesco is great. Yeah. I did a parody of Shape of Water called Shape of Elvira, which was basically <laughs> Elvira starring in Shape of Water, and for whatever reason. Francisco did the covers. Francisco did the covers, and they were so beautiful and haunting. <laughs> I was like, "These suit some sort of swamp thing thing we should do together at some point." But yeah, they are wild covers for a for a slapstick comedy. <laughs> like yeah. he drew, he he captured her beauty so well. I was like, "These are for the gothic romance novel adaptation <clears throat> of this." I it's, oh yeah. Oh, yeah, he terrific. He did some covers for Twilight Zone The Shadow for me uh, about four years ago, and I yeah. fell in love with his work. It's so good. Yeah. And he's such a good guy. Yeah, he also. did a cover. Yeah, he did. Uh, he, oh, let's go ahead. Sorry. Uh, yeah, he did a cover for uh, uh, Army of Darkness Furious Road, uh, which, which I did for Dynamite. And, and originally he wasn't slated to do it. But when I when I first met him, he said, "Well, what are you doing <laughs> for Dynamite?" And I said, "Well, um, I'm doing this uh, Army of Darkness thing where it's set 20 years in the future, where it's all um, where Ash has to team up with like like Frankenstein, Dracula, Dracula's daughter, a werewolf biker guy." He goes, "I have to draw that." I didn't even get out of finished describing it. That's great. <laughs> He'll find a way. Yeah, he did the connecting covers to the four Archie Kiss issues, and they all form one big image, which for something so bizarre and off the wall to add his gravitas was really nice. Those, yeah. uh, th th those Archie Meets books are, are, are really good. I mean, the, the Ar you know, Archie Meets the Punisher was, uh, was pretty sublime. <laughs> it's just, uh, just a beautiful pairing, and, and you know, I oh, think cool. they're all good. Yeah, oh, I, I really yeah, enjoyed the, the yeah. Archie versus the Archie meets the Predator two series last year <laughs> yeah. or this year. The sequel. Oh, uh, last year, yeah, yeah last yeah, yeah. year. And I love the. Yeah, no, the can't be did. She, Alex is fantastic. She Alex is fantastic, great. and Hack did uh, those great. He did that one Andy Sedaris cover. <laughs> that yeah, just. He does the yeah. movie poster. Yeah, he did, yeah. He did, a, he, did a, he did a he did a recreation of the hard ticket to Hawaii poster. Yeah, and it's such it. a. And we were actually talking about this on Twitter the other day, and Alex DeCampi did not recognize the reference. Oh, really? Which was she was like, "Oh, now I see where you got that from." Amazing. Yeah. Very, very. No, funny. that was really like a blessing to have them both together and have yeah. you know Hack is he's so known for his covers, but he's a great interior artist yeah. too. So the people well, not, not really everyone's that. soaking in in trash culture the way a lot of us are. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, get, yeah. I get reminded of that every now and again. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I just well, want to know while we have you here, who's who's Archie going to meet next? Um. um I'm awaiting it with uh, with bated breath. Uh, you know, he, well, I think the last one we did was the B-52s, and that was fun because it was set. We set it in the yeah. '80s, and it was, uh, you know, you got to meet the original B-52s, and he got to jam with them. So, you know, we've got stuff mm -hmm. like that. Always, there's always discussion. So, I, I am standing by to write <laughs> Archie meets the Who for you. Uh, <laughs> Who's uh, left? Yeah, I don't know that Archie and Steely Dan would go anywhere. Uh, yeah, no, uh, I, don't, I don't think there's a lot of story there. But Archie meets. I mean, the my girl, white whale there. is Talking Heads and Beatles and you know Taylor yeah, sure. Swift. You know, if we need to be timely. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Archie's meet Marilyn Manson. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All righty. Well, the the topic I wanted to talk to you today about today, uh, just to kick us off. Um, is about process, uh, not the art of writing comic, but the craft, how you approach pitches and outlines and scripts, coordinating with the rest of the team. Uh, I mean, as I came to comics pretty late from film, and my biggest shock off the top of the bat was that there was no such thing as a script format for comic books. <laughs> that I bought a book of scripts, and I was like, every single one of these is different and half of them are incoherently, like, are bad formats for trying to communicate any information <laughs> to an artist. And these were great scripts by great writers. And I was still like, this is some yeah. counterintuitive stuff. 
So yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. never ever ever model yourself after Alan Moore's script. Oh no, <laughs> Alan, that's like as I, I've explained to people. That's like studying the Bible or replicating the Bible. To, you know, in terms of like your prose narrative. So there's you know, yeah. there's a lot to learn from it. But you, yeah, <laughs> there's yeah. a you know, don't don't you know, take your inspiration, but not your direction. And it's a lot of yeah, it's a lot of all, a a lot of all caps for, for for no reason. I don't know. You know, it's hard for me to sort through that. And it's, yeah, it's a bad joke. Go ahead, yeah. Alex. I interrupt. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's a good one. Yeah, no, it's just there's a, an easier path from idea to script that yeah. it's not the Alan Moore method. <laughs> yeah, I mean, again, look, you know, you you can't argue with success and what works for one person. That's that's ultimately what comes down to. I always <laughs> think of the Neil Gaiman quote, uh, which I will paraphrase that you know, most writing has an audience of more than three people, but a comic book script is a letter to an artist at most. Yeah. And mm -hmm. yes, it'd be great if your editor understands it. Um, be great if your colorist understands it and your letterer, but uh, mostly you want to make sure the, uh, the artist can, and just to, you know, to start off from my thing with format, I asked a colleague who was working for the same company I was working for, who I will not name, what their format was, they sent it to me. I looked at it and went, well, there's a lot of unnecessary tab stops and all caps stuff in here, but it's what's yeah. being used by this company, so I'm going to use it. And I used it for two, three years, and then I did my first solo uh, creator-owned project with Kevin Eastman, and he, I sent him the first script, and he was like, where'd you get this format from, man? Because... <laughs> Yikes. <laughs> yeah. And I think he sent Amazing. me one of Tom Waltz's uh, Ninja Turtle scripts. And I'm, well, that's much better. I'm going to use yeah. that. I think Tom didn't uh, number his dialogue balloons. That was the one thing I changed. I'm like, I'm a big believer. I really like being able to say balloon five on page five, change it to this instead of the part where he says, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah. other than that, that was my big. But I wanted to start with. Uh, at the beginning with pitching, um, you know, what have you been asked to provide and how have you provided it? A paragraph, you know, how much detail, what has been your experience with pitching, with writing pitches? You know, it's funny, you're, you're asking me this just as I'm in the throes of, I teach a class at Lit Reactor just about pitching. And, oh, okay. um, mm -hmm. you know, one of the cool. things I tell the students is always, you know, your format can vary just like your script format can vary, but it has to elementally evoke a comic book. So when an editor reads it, they have to feel like they're seeing the comic book, whether that means you have a really detailed story or a very intricate breakdown. You know, you never want it to be more than a couple pages because an editor is going to have 10 or 15 minutes. And most editors, and I just know this being an editor, like you have a day of the week where you sit and look at pitches or, you know, a carved, carved out amount of time and you want the pitch to kind of get you right away. And if it's, if it's this long drawn out pitch for a 40 issue series with, detailed character breakdowns and uh, you know it's, it's just you're you're just not going to get it so I, I think you just need to evoke the story as best you can and there are buckets you can put that into you know like high concept tagline story breakdown and, and those are the things I tell my students like these are the the things you probably want in your pitch but it doesn't mean they have to be in there I've read pitches that are just stream of consciousness consciousness couple paragraphs and I'm compelled to say yes let's do this um, and then on the other end of the spectrum there's something that's very intricate and and structured that I also will green light and, uh, and in terms of my writing it's usually you know give me the basics of the story give me the characters and and how many issues you need and uh, you know just you know you have to think about it from a publishing perspective like how many buckets do I need to fill in terms of story and page count and dialogue and things like that and then you also have to think about it creatively like what's the little arcs what are the little arcs and what's the big arc and what's where do you leave things at the end so one one of the best things about comics is it can be so fluid and it's really a relationship thing with your editor like you know what does this person expect from you what can you deliver and you know how can you do that clearly and concisely and you know evocatively you want the you want the editor to read this and say oh wow yeah i, I need this i need right. this in my life i need this kind of idea of a comic book that you've given me or this feeling of a comic to become real. So. Yeah. If for me, it's been, well, uh, I'm, I'm kind of atypical cause I'm from an older non-existent form of how comics were made. You know, and, 
I'm trying to like um, adapt to how it's done now. But I was I came in probably at the last tail end of of the old school uh, comic book creation chain, where it was all done. To, you know, your editor found you, mm -hmm. and um, and your art team was assembled for you. And um, in this case, um, my first gig writing comics was writing Swamp Thing for two years. So I got to learn how to write comics in public, <laughs> which is a lot like learning how to walk in public. You know, they just are you, you take you to the deep end of the swimming pool. Ah, there you go. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, let us, you know, flail around it while you can. And, um, and so I didn't really, uh, they, they were looking for a horror writer to come in and basically rescue the series at that time. Cause it, this was like 91, 90, 91, uh, the Doug Wheeler run on Swamp Thing. And, uh, the monthly book, uh, circulation had gotten down to below 40,000, which they would dance a ring around the rosy now. <laughs> if they had 40,000, <laughs> that would be up there. That'd be Superman numbers right there. Yeah. Um, Even today, there are there are there are Superman books that absolutely do not clear forty thousand right yeah. now. There are Spider Man books that don't clear forty thousand yeah. right now. And um, and it, back then, anything that got to forty thousand that put you on the bubble, you dropped below thirty, then you were axed. And the only reason Swamp Thing was not getting axed like it usually would have been is because they had a toy line and a cable TV series at the time. Yeah. So they were. It so it behooved them to keep the, the comic going, and um, so they decided to try and bring it back to its, his roots, <laughs> so to speak. So it, me and about three or four other horror writers had been tapped to provide pitches, and at that time I was living in New Orleans, so I decided to play up the the local. Sure. Color aspect of it, and apparent and and that seemed to win them over. I don't think anyone gave any thought or consideration to the fact I was a woman. Mm. Yeah, it was just you know that, you know that 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 didn't factor into it. In fact, the the fact of the matter was I was a horror writer, mm -hmm. and I and I had a best selling book at the time, and I had a um, and I had local you know, the local color aspect that, that they were looking for. And um, so I did a, a, a outline of the first 12 issues, for a year's worth of issues. And at that time, there was, still, there was no such thing as writing for the trades back then. So it was like one or two issues instead of like these humongous story arcs that they have now. Um, and, you know, like one and done's Monster of the Week kind of stuff. And... Um, so, I, and they, and they didn't have to be more than a paragraph long, you know, just, to, you know, give them an idea of what, you know, and it, it had to be moving forward. Mm -hmm. And the second, the second year I was actually able to plot a little bit more and, and, uh, but, but also in the second year, they told me where they wanted Swamp Thing to go. And basically they wanted him to not have a wife or child at the end of it. So I had to work it, write everything, structure everything to go to that point. They were expecting me to kill them. And it's, it, including the child who was like two years old in the story. Yikes. And I had spent a lot of time making her a believable toddler. And make, you know, because I had all my nieces and nephews were around the same age too. So I had, you know, so I was actually able to build something there. And uh, and I think I did something. I don't think a man would have done this. This is this is something I think maybe me being a woman, and plus it already killed his wife before Alan killed her, and so it's like I'm not going to go back and walk over Alan's ground. Okay. Um. So I get so I had him um, fuck up his marriage. 
<laughs> Much more realistic. Uh, more genuine. Yeah, more realistic. Yeah. yeah. Well, as Alan said, no one would interrupt. I would just put up with all that. <laughs> so, his actual actually called me up to tell me, that, yeah, he he was all for them breaking up because no nobody no woman in the right mind would, would put up with it. Right. And um. And I think that was yeah. And the thing is. To my knowledge, they never got back. I, I kind of stopped reading the books after that. But to my knowledge, they never, in that continuity, they were never reunited because apparently, you know, you can kill people in comics and they can come back all the time. It, it, but death means nothing in comics. But apparently divorce is forever. <laughs> Can't save the marriage. So, you know, because none of us know what's, what's on the other end of that. Of, the, of that light at the end of the tunnel, but a good number of us have been to divorce court. <laughs> <laughs> so. It's a complete aside, but if, did any of you read a few years ago, Jim Starlin did a Thanos miniseries in which the entire Marvel universe was collapsing and everyone was dying and no one could figure out what it was. And eventually the cause was that when they brought Captain Marvel back from the dead, it screwed up everything and destroyed reality. And I love the pettiness of that. <laughs> I love that Jim Starlin was like, I killed Captain Marvel. He was supposed to stay dead. Yeah. You fuckers brought him back. I'm destroying the entire universe. That, yeah. <laughs> yeah. To, yeah. To get you back from that. Who was your editor on Swamp Thing, Nancy? Uh, Stuart Moore. Okay. Stuart Moore. Uh, who's now with Ahoy. Oh, okay. Uh, comics. Um uh, he, he, he branched off to become a writer himself, and is but but uh, he's also associated with the Hoy comics, I believe. Mm -hmm. uh, doing Dragonfly Man, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and Dr. Ginger, I think he's writing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's he does a lot of stuff. Cool. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, um, he was um, he was uh, he had been a uh, editor at at uh, Saint Martin's Books. When I first met him, that, that that's how I ended up be, be getting on the Swamp Thing shortlist. Is he was an editor on um, for short, for uh, Saint Martin's Press for a series of Nightmare on Elm Street prose anthologies, which he hated yeah. doing. <laughs> he just hated them, and and uh, I was uh, um, Babe Imhoff over at New Line Cinema liked my work and he told him I want Nancy Collins to write a story for this and he said okay well do you have your information well yeah okay and so he contacted me and I wrote a short story uh, short story a novelette for him called Not Just a Job that barely had Freddy Krueger in it it was more closer to like the Freddy's Nightmares show <clears throat> than, than anything involving Freddy Krueger and uh, he really liked it because it was one of the few he didn't have to edit that much. <laughs> it's valuable. It's valuable. That is, time. that is how to get editors editors to love you. Yeah, that's a good way yeah. to get an editor. Yeah, yeah, prove to an editor that you don't. They don't have to to ride your ass like a horse and hit deadlines and hit deadlines and not give them too too much feed uh, grief about having to go back and do stuff or do what they tell you to do. Yeah, mm -hmm. just be easy. Be, be 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 reasonable and, and yeah. relatively easy to work with. Yeah, I've been very very lucky with pitching. Uh, aside from the creator own stuff, almost all of my work has been with uh, Dynamite, and uh, it's sort of a good news bad news thing. But it's mostly good <clears> news. <throat> uh, generally, Ryband will say, "Do you want to write this character? What would you do?" And I write a pitch for a four issue series usually honestly usually not more than a paragraph an issue uh, and I get a green light one every once in a while when there's a licensor involved I get a yeah they don't want the shadow to do that yeah, yeah. I don't th I did a thing uh Twilight Zone the shadow my first thing was that uh the shadow convinces Lamont Cranston he should it's the depression you should use your money to help poor people and not <laughs> necessarily be shooting up the place um, like, yeah, no, that's not yeah. that's not where we want that to go. <laughs> go for that. Which is well, yeah. fine. It was worth it was worth a shot. Hey, but, Doc Savage, maybe you shouldn't be handing out lobotomies. Like, oh, that that, that is such a crazy <laughs> aspect of that character. For yeah. those at home who do not know, 
Doc Savage, who's in many ways the template for Superman. In the 1930s, he had a thing called the Crime College in upstate New York, where Very once much. he captured a criminal, he would take them to the Crime College, perform some kind of lobotomy science experiment on them, and turn them into good citizens. Wow. With half of their brain missing. Yeah, not a, you know, like, uh, and even the prequel worse, to identity crisis. Even yeah, worse, like, they then would work for him. So, like, he had lobotomy. <laughs> yeah. But that was what, you know, people thought science could <clears throat> solve the problem of evil in the 1930s. Oh, that was then. back in the days of eugenics, too. <laughs> yeah, so. exactly. And then World War II came along and went, oh, you know what? Science does not at all solve the problem of evil. Good, good. Super no science surely doesn't. Yeah. It does yeah. maybe the opposite a lot of the times. But, yeah. Uh, but yeah. The, the downside to uh i should never complain about getting an easy yes but the downside is a lot of times those paragraphs are very skimpy and a lot mm -hmm. of times i hit issue three and i'm like i don't know where there's 20 pages in these three lines <laughs> like i don't yeah, know what the hell I was, not enough meat on the bone i don't know what i was thinking that this three line description of an issue was actually had a whole issue of a comic book in it but that's it's fine and a thing that happens to me a lot with them again not to complain about it at all is they'll they'll contract me for a four issue series and then in the middle of issue two they'll say can it be five <laughs> and That's then good. in the issue of issue yeah. middle of issue three they'll be i'm sorry did <clears throat> we say five we meant eight uh so that there's a there's a variety of ways i have learned to adjust to that i've gotten very good at writing one issue epilogues to four issue series, like yeah, well, it usually goes the story. other way. And they say, can you do, can you do one issue less? <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, or less. Yeah, more. You can always work with more, but less. Yeah. That's a that's less a, is much harder. Yeah, it's funny. The I, very first season series I did was twenty two pages, and everything since then has been twenty. And man, do I miss those two pages? I when that's I started the room. industry standard was twenty four. Right. Right. That's where you get your subplots. The B plots can breathe in those yeah. two or three pages. Yeah. Oh, it also yeah. helps you. Well, that you know, also you know, the two page spl uh, splash. Yeah, exactly. You kind of that's a lot of real estate to give up when you've got only yeah. eighteen more pages to tell the story. Of course, back in the day, there's also a ton of comics that are a twelve page top story or a sixteen page top story, and then a six mm -hmm. page or a twelve page backup. Well, like I can't get, figure out why they're why they're shortening them up. It's not like there's advertising in in these magazines anymore. Well and a Custom lot of the payback. when there is advertising it's usually in the barrels. It's the house ads, yeah. Yeah, it's it's the house ads. Again, I lucked out with that. I traded ads with them on my creator owned comic. And nice. even when my creator owned comic was no longer on the stands Dynamite's production department would just keep throwing the ad in because they were like, yeah, we're paid short on we're Red Sonia this month. Them. Throw Avalone's ad in there. <laughs> Comic's been yeah. out of print for three months, but okay, great. Sure. You know, I'll take the, I, I guess I'll take the, take the awareness. Yeah. I, 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 I guess before I get into my, you know, my little diatribe on, on pitching here, um, a, a, a little plug for a friend. If you are a comic creator out there, a would be comic creator, and you want a very quick, very succinct, but very valuable masterclass on comics pitching, uh, uh, Jim Zub has this amazing kind of primer tutorial on his website, uh, jimzub.com. And if you, uh, if you go on the website and you look on the right side, there's uh, a section uh, about halfway down the page called tutorials. And he gets into gets into all this stuff, um, you know, uh, uh, pitching, scripting, the whole nine yards. But um, he has some really interesting thoughts on pitching. And I guess I should frame this by saying that, um, you know, the lion's share of my comic experience has, has been on creator-owned things. And it's been about pitching my series to uh, a company rather than going in and pitching on, a, uh, you know, on, a, on an established character. Um, not that I haven't done a bit of that. Uh, all that said, I spent 15 years in Hollywood pitching on other people's ideas. So, so uh, it, it, is, it is strikingly similar. And, um, and uh, you know, I guess what I've learned over 15 years and what has been cemented, uh, um, you know, in my experience in the comic world is that um, your initial pitch is in a lot of ways the beginning of a much longer conversation. I mean, I think Alex hit it right on the head where it's like you do not want to 
like inundate and overwhelm right off the bat. Um, mm-hmm. uh, particularly if you are pitching a creator owned series, uh, uh, you know, you are, um, as he said, you are dealing with an editor who maybe has like an hour or two at the end of a Friday before he or she runs off to have like drinks with her like colleagues or her friends or something like that. And so, (laughs) so yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Maybe that's a dated reference, but, but (laughs) you know, you, 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 you open up the folder in which you dump all that stuff and you start going through. Right. And, um, and you, you have 20 more than you can, than you can possibly even put eyes on. Right. Um, And you are going through them. And uh, you can tell right off the bat which which you should take seriously and which you you just necessarily can't, right? Um, and you know if they open up a forty page uh, uh, you know rant and rave about what this new series is, it's just it's getting it's getting tossed in the you know in the in, in the trash uh, folder immediately. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, uh, it's such never a great it your house. Check, well, you know. <laughs> You'd be surprised how many people send in pro- send in pitches that have never bothered to run it through spell check. Yeah, and, I mean, and, I tell and, my and, students that all uh, the time. You know, spelling and grammar, it, anything that pulls the editor out of the reading experience is mm-hmm. one strike against you, and you don't. You may not even get three. Like, if I'm reading a yeah. pitch and there's an egre- egregious typo, or you, it's clear that someone's just copying and pasting a pitch for something else and reformatting it to be an Archie pitch, like that stuff that just it pulls you out of the experience, and you want you want the editor to feel like they're reading your comic before it even exists. And, uh, yeah. you know, the fastest way to evoke that is, is that's your answer. And, uh, one of the things I tell my students and I tell writers that are pitching is, you know, show, obviously it's show, it's show, don't tell. And he, that applies to even a pitch. You want, you want the color, you want the evocative character moments, throw in some dialogue, just give a sense of a comic as opposed to just yeah telling me what's going to happen. Like, you know, Superman walks in and he's mad. Why is he mad? What happened? Who's Superman? Like, just give me the be- the beats, you know, it make me feel like I'm reading something instead of just you telling me a story. Well, and, and, and when I'm sending in a, a creator on pitch, I think it's, um, you know, it's, it's almost like a, I, I do two documents. Okay. And, 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 and this is, you know, uh, I mean, the reason that I like Zub's uh, approach so much is that he does a similar thing. On all, on all those things. And so I will do like a two page, I will do a two page document, a two page pitch. And then I will do a larger kind of six page pitch that is more fleshed out. So my two page pitch is, um, it is the short and skinny. It's like, this is, this is the basic plot. This is the tone. These are the influences. This is what is different and interesting about it. These are the thematics. These are the characters. I do that in two quick pages. And it is all about it is you are putting fishing hooks in the line. You are trying to hook and interest an editor. You know what I'm saying? You are create you are creating these big kind of dramatic, meaty questions that is going to pull somebody in. And then at the end of the thing, you haven't taken up too much of their time, and hopefully you have intrigued them enough. And 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 at the end of the document, you say, Hey, I have a you know uh, I have I have all four issues beat out. You know I, I have a larger document that goes into this further. If you would like to see that, let me know. And um, and if you've done your job right, uh, that editor is going to be intrigued. They are going to be thankful that you respected their time, and they are then going to come to you and ask for that document. Um, yeah, and I, the only addendum I I'm sorry, I keep interrupting. You. Yeah, no, no, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> no, yeah. I was just going to say that you know, and time is money for any writer. You know, yeah, you know, so I I always do I do the succinct pitch, and and then I wait, and if they want more, then you do the expanded pitch, and, and you, you kind of out. keep. Sure. It's like the next step yeah. of of the chain, and uh, yeah. you know, it's great to always have it ready, but. Um, it's, it's also how much are you willing to invest in, in each stage? And so being open to, to the next step is important. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, in a, in a creator own thing, it's, it's something that I'm, I'm, I'm doing anyway. You're doing so, it anyway. So, yeah. so, so, so it's there, but, but I totally agree if I'm, if I'm pitching on something, uh, uh, you know, it, it, per, you know, particularly in Hollywood and, 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 you know, a lesson I've taken from Hollywood is, so I'm, I, 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 I will tell this story and I will kind of throw it out to you guys and, and, and leave it. Um, uh, uh, it, it is so often proved that less is more, um, and, 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 and quality over quantity, um, you know, because, okay. So when, uh, again, I've been writing in Hollywood for about 15 years. And so when I, when I, when I got spit out of film school and I started writing, um, it was fairly easy to sell a pitch or to sell a spec script in Hollywood. A spec script is a script that you've written on your own without, you know, any, uh, for those who don't know, 
um, uh, not you guys, but the guys listening and watching. Um, uh, and uh, you know, I I got spit out of I got spit out of film school. And if you wrote a good script, it would go out, and you would if it was good, you would sell it. That's just how it happened. Well. Then the financial crisis hit right around uh, uh, the time the writer strike hit, and everything imploded. Uh, the studios used it as a way to kind of remake the way they they do business entirely. Um, kind of overnight, they were making about a third as many movies as they were making, uh, uh, you know, um, a, a few months before. Um, uh, all the independent money dried up. Um, you know, the the indie film movement moved, moved down to TV, and then suddenly it was kind of impossible to sell a spec or a pitch, right? Um, and uh, and what happened around the same time is this IP revolution happened in, in Hollywood, where like every movie had to, had to be based on something, right? Whether it was a book, a TV show, a comic book, uh, uh, whatever. And um, and and. You know, I spent, I, I had a couple of lean years in Hollywood where I was still trying to sell specs and pitches and, and striking out. And finally I got wise and I said, hey, if they want IP, why don't I just give them IP, right? And I and and I took a, a, a an idea that I had been, you know, trying to sell as a pitch for a while, knew I wouldn't be able to. And I wrote it as a short story. I got the short story published and almost overnight we had a bidding war over it. We had, uh, we had uh, uh, Justin Lin on one side coming off of... Uh, uh, Fast and the Furious 6, which was the largest opening in, in Universal Summer history. It might still be. And we had uh, Brett Ratner and Robert De Niro on the other side. And, and, and we had a bunch of other offers on it. Tyler Perry was was, was trying to get in and uh, and everything like that. Just, just massive, you know, it was the biggest success I, I, I had had in my career at that point. Um, and, and, and you know, when the, the agents, the managers kind of thought it was a fluke. What the hell did we do with a short story, right? And um, I... I just, I knew it wasn't a fluke. And so I set out to prove them wrong and short and sweet. I've done it, you know, six times with short, six times with short stories since then. I've done it a couple of times with comic books and and now kind of like IP is my business. And I've realized, well, you can't just be a screenwriter anymore, right? Like you have to kind of be a writer, you know, and, and, and you were just creating stories and, uh, and, and you kind of never know what sort of format, what arena these stories are going to play in. Right. And, 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 and these stories can kind of be adapted to different arenas and, and all of that stuff. So that is the backstory. And I'm sorry for the long story, but I am telling you this story by way of setting this up is that the short story as a pitching tool, uh, uh, it was a remarkable lesson, right? Because there was an art to writing a short story that you were going to sell as, as a movie. Um, and, and, you know, the word, I mean, the beauty of them is that they are so short and they are so sweet. It is not this 300, 400 page novel that, that it's going to take, you know, uh, an executive like a week or two on and off of reading this thing to get through it. Right. You are, you are boiling down an idea to 15 pages sometimes. Right. Um, and, uh, and however, those 15 pages have to pack like a mighty punch. Right. So, so you are, you are, you are fully building out a world. You are you, you, you want this rich, vibrant world. You want them to be able to kind of, uh, you know, stick their finger down on the, uh, you know, on the table of a story and feel the dust and all that stuff. Um, uh, it helps a lot if these things are written first person because you are um, you are writing in the protagonist's voice, so they 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 clearly get a sense of 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 you know, of who this person is, what his or her personality is, uh, uh, their likes, their dislikes. Are they going to lie to you? Or are they going to try to bullshit you? All these things, um, you know, that, that becomes, that becomes very interesting. And then you also have to, you also have to give them a sense that in these 15 pages, there is an entire movie, three acts, right? Set up, middle, pay off the whole nine yards. Either that, or, or more, more importantly, now, I mean, what's changed over these last kind of eight, you know, years that I've been doing this is TV is a much bigger thing. So, so can we set, you know, could we set a season in this in this uh, in this world? Could we with this character? Could we do a hundred episodes? Who knows? And so, you want to accomplish all that in in fifteen pages, right? Um, uh, um, but the art of doing that is doing less, right? Um, you know, what, what, what I noticed is that um, it is the ultimate irony of Hollywood is that executives, producers, they are paid to develop, right? But, but they have no desire to do it when it comes to a pitch or a, uh, or, or a, or a script. A, a traditional pitch, a traditional script in Hollywood 
um, is every decision is made. You are telling the story from start to finish. Like, you know, uh, a, um, a, a, a pitch in Hollywood, you are going to be talking for 30 straight minutes. This happens, this happens, this happens, this happens, and this happens, much like I'm doing now, I apologize. Uh, uh, a script, obviously, is it, it is a blueprint for a movie. Literally, every decision is made. Um, and so, if I write my story as a script, a, a, a producer, a development executive will read it, and if they don't like 2% of that script, they are for some, even though they are in the business of development, of changing scripts for a living, they will toss it over their shoulder and, and throw it out the window. For whatever reason, uh, they see a short story, they see a comic book as completely malleable, right? They may hate 90% of, of what you show them, but if they like one big idea in that thing, if they like, if they like the voice of the character, if they if they can find one thing to really fall in love with, they will they will buy it and they will pay you to write it, and 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 the ultimate end product in a, in a movie sense will end up being you know maybe in a lot of ways very different from where you started, uh, but it can also be just as good. I mean, there's the, that 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 short story um, that we originally sold to uh, to Justin Lin. It, it didn't you know we we got paid handsomely to write a movie for Justin. Uh, then his universal deal lapsed and the story came back to us. That's, that's the other beauty of doing this is that if we, if we sold a script to Justin, he would own it forever. If you, if you option a short story to Justin Lin and he doesn't use it after a year, it comes back to you, you're free to option it again. We've sold that story uh, 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 two more times. And, uh, and, and, and now it's with JJ Abrams and, uh, and, um, and each, uh, each incarnation of, of of this story of this movie has been very different, uh, but each is equally interesting, um, and so uh, and, and so I, I am throwing that out there, and that um, and that less is more. Like uh, uh, in terms of a pitch, the idea I think a, a lot of times the key is leaving gaps in the in the in the story in the enterprise that an executive that an editor can kind of um, uh, kind of fill with their ideas right? Uh, invest some of their themselves in it. Um, and then it becomes kind of like, instead of my project, it's our project and we're moving this forward, right? They take some ownership of it. Um, and I think strategically finding a way to do that is very important. That, that, that's been my experience over 15 years in Hollywood. Well, I have definitely seen the thing where someone rejects a script and you ask them why, and it's something that 10 minutes of writing would change. Like I've, I've seen them say, yeah, we don't like it because it takes place in New York and we'd rather it takes place in Boston. And you're like, I could that's probably a fine place. <laughs> change that. Like that's not yeah. really, yeah. that's not really. The other thing I will say though, is I feel like in the history of Hollywood, not to get away from comic books, but I think this is borne out by how Nancy got into comic books. Uh, whatever field you're working in, the people who make the money decisions in that field are more impressed with achievement outside of their field. Yes. The first big studio writing job I ever got, I got because I was a comic book artist, or a comic book writer, excuse me, after 30 years of trying to get movies made in the studio system. When I was a comic book writer, they're like, oh, we have this comic book project. We would love your input. Mm -hmm. The hell with your 30 years of filmmaking experience. That is of no interest in us. Uh, and. And I think that the period that has been true the entire history of Hollywood, the spec script period was a very narrow period. I mean, watch, you know, Mank, which is not, in my opinion, a very good movie, but that period in Hollywood was a bunch of New York writers who had zero experience in film being given a ton of money to come to Hollywood and write mostly unfilmable screenplays that other people <laughs> yeah. had to fix. <laughs> I don't know how much William Faulkner there is into have and have not, but I'm going to say it's less than 5%. Yeah. You know, there's yeah. definitely less than 5% of Hemingway in it. I think it's mostly the character names and the location, but my point being it's is like, cash day. yeah, is like they, they, they love Nancy because she was a best-selling author who had never written a comic book in her life. But you know? to their surprise, I actually knew a lot about comics. Sure. That definitely that and that definitely helps, and that's yeah. also the thing well, of, you know, the uh, an overall thing is always, you know, know your industry. Don't yeah, yeah. And, 
Yeah, and yeah. you're hitting on two. You're hitting on two things here. It's like you are w w when you are pitching your story. You are you are as much pitching yourself as pitching your story, and you need mm -hmm. to pitch yourself in a very succinct way and and frame yourself in a very succinct way. And that all leads back to this point I was making is that there is a there is a psychology to pitching, right? And and and, and it's about um, I mean the information stays the same. It's about how you package it. Uh, to best be consumed by uh, you know the person on the other side of the, this table, right? And, and and there's a psychology to all of it. It's like uh, I mean you're you're selling, right? And yeah. and there was a psychology to setting up Kmart, right? Uh, uh, you know how do we arrange the aisles? What do we put where? What do we put up front? What do we put on sale? All of that stuff. And 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 that same psychology needs to go into arranging packaging and presenting your story idea right and the i would like to make one i would like to make one one statement though is Go ahead. for everyone who's watching this is one thing you should always be more than aware of when you go into comics try to go into comics as a writer <laughs> is that you are probably one of the least necessary aspects of the industry as far as the industry is concerned. <laughs> um, uh, artists, it is a visual medium. The art, your artist will make or break your book. Does it matter how good you you are as a writer if the fans don't like your art artist or they give you a bad artist, you're, you're, you know, you're going to go down the tapes, and, well, and, yeah, it, so it, and this is and this is the thing. If if the book does well, it's the it's the artist to you know, get the credit, and if it tanks, it's your fault <laughs> as the writer, and that's how it works. Just kind of like Hollywood, like yeah. you know, yeah, you know, they, they can't be bothered to piss on you when you're on fire, except. To take for you to take the blame for something tanking at the box office. Yeah, and, no, I've been lucky and I've had great artists for most of what I've done, and a couple of times I've had people who were ungreat. <laughs> I would say. I think I would just call it workmanlike. Yeah, and I like I even have trouble recommending people to go back and read those issues. I'm like. Maybe yeah. skip that part uh, and go to the next part. And you know, again, some of it, you know, there's a lot of reasons why I've, I've had I've had great artists who turned in subpar work for me too, for a variety of reasons, you know. And my biggest problem with DC and Marvel is that they have they have like scores of artists, and, and they'll uh, but they but especially Marvel and DC will rely on a handful of writers. And they'll give each of these writers like five or six books. And then they wonder why their sales go down. And it's because it's the same guy writing the same thing for decades with the same yep. characters. And you're not changing your underwear enough. Yep. Yeah. And, and was, you've got 50 year old men trying to bring in the, you know, trying to talk like hip young dudes. And, or trying to appeal to women or young girls or trying to, or, and it, so there's not a lot of diversity in comics because of that. There's not a lot of, and, but, and for diversity that to me doesn't mean whether or not you're, you're white, black, you know, Hispanic, gay, straight, or, you know, Asian, whatever. It, 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 that, that's not what it means to me. It means they have a different voice. Your voice isn't exactly the same as the all the other voices coming out of all the other characters you're it's, surrounded it's by. Diver, it's diversity of experience, and it's the difference yeah. between a comic book writer who writes comic books because they've read a lot of comic books, or a and comic so, book writer who is familiar with literate. the wider <laughs> world. Yeah, you know, yeah. I mean, I would, I would, I, would, I still, I still I, think, yeah, di diversity still should mean reflecting the world around you in yeah. terms but, of who the. People and unfortunately, are. there are a lot of guys who are basically just jumped up fanboys who, yeah, you know, well, got, I I've been using got an editor his coffee once. Yeah, <laughs> I've, I've been using the Mandalorian as an example of how to do something that's part of a larger. Uh, 
a larger world right, which is yeah. a lot of people that write Star Wars are imitating George Lucas and Larry Kasdan. Yes. What's great about The Mandalorian is it's imi imitating Akira Kurosawa and Sergio and Leone Leon. and yeah. John Ford, which is what George Lucas was imitating. Don't imitate the guy whose universe you're adding to. Imitate the people they were imitating. That's yes. the, you know, don't, don't try to, if you want to do a Coen Brothers knockoff, don't imitate the Coen Brothers. Imitate Dashiell Hammett, you know, yeah. or Fellini, you know, like there's, it's a... Uh, or just write to your own passions. I mean, write right. the story that you want to write. I mean, what I always tell writers is, you know, what's the story that you only you can fill in? Like, what's the story right. you're passionate about? And, you know, going back to comics and, you know, the thing I would always suggest to people and the thing that I try to do is you enter the process humbly, you know, enter with humility, you know. I'm a writer, I'm not an artist, so I cannot dictate to an artist how they should visualize it. I can make suggestions. And one of the things I always say to preface a script is, these are suggestions. You know, I'm, I'm telling you camera angles that I'm visualizing, and as long as you evoke what I'm trying to evoke, but do it with your own style and your obvious expertise, then we'll find a happy medium. And I think that's that's the magic of comics, that collaborative process. Like the, uh, you know, the, the culmination is much greater than the pieces, you know. Sure. Um, and I think a lot of that is lost with overwritten scripts, like over detailed. And, you know, Alan Moore, there's only one Alan Moore and we cannot yeah. try to be Alan Moore, you know? So he, he can do it because he's, he's, he's the one. Alan, but don't imitate Alan. Yeah. yeah, don't don't try to be Alan, be yourself and also be open to collaborating. And I, I find that the best surprises in comics are when the artist kind of riffs off your idea and doesn't do it exactly, they do it their own way and it becomes this greater thing. Um, we were talking a little bit about pitching and, and how, you know, kind of, prepping content to be pitched later. I think the best thing you can do is write the best comic you can write, write the best short story you can write, and write the best novel you can write. And then eventually that will give you the content to pitch it for something else. I think, you know, creating this buzz around what it is and then knowing that you can parlay that into something else, but you have to come in, you know, there's so many comic book pitches that are clearly written to be movies, you know, you and have I see it. To go with that sizzle. Yeah, you know, you see it. You just see, you can tell out of the gate, okay, this was a screenplay that became a graphic novel to kind of be backdoored as a comic, uh, mm -hmm. backdoored into being a movie. And, and I would just say, you know, kind of tap into the passion of that initial medium. You know, be passionate of that initial medium, and that'll show in the work. Well, that's, um, I, I get the question all the time because I, I started in movies and moved to comic books. Right. Screenwriters reach out to me all the time and say, should I do a comic book? And I always say, are you excited to do a comic book? Yeah. Is this a great comic book? And if it never gets made into a movie, will you fucking love this comic book for the rest of your life? Because if that's not the case, you are spending months out of your life making a fucking brochure for a movie that's never going to get made. Yeah. And so tens of thousands make, of dollars. Yeah. Don't spend yeah. all yeah. that time and money on a fucking brochure, man. Mm -hmm. Love your comic book. Yeah. You yeah. know, comics are not like these things that you just drop into the water and they become a comic book. There's a slog, there's creative differences, there's challenges, there's editorial yeah. oversight. It's not it's not a one to one thing. No. And and movies that what you were saying about collaboration, working on movies did teach me that to the degree of I know that when I get to the set, I ask the actors to run the scene first before giving them direction, before telling them where yeah. to stand, where to sit, what to do. Let's see what they want to do. Where do they want to stand? Right. Where do they want to sit? When does he want to cross to the window? And then you can say, all of that was wrong. <laughs> or you can say, I want to use that and that and that and that. Yeah. Or you can say, that was great. You know, I always do a draft. You, I, this, I don't know how common this is. It's probably pretty common. But I always do a draft after the inks. Because I, <laughs> there's always something. There's always at least one joke or one idea or one thing that I... I had no idea was going to be there. You know, I had no have? idea the artist. The artist puts it in. <laughs> yeah. And, and sometimes they put in something and you're like, well, I, there ha these characters would comment on that. I can't leave that without dialogue. It's right. too funny to just sit there, you know. And sometimes the last thing I did with uh, Dave Acosta, the last Elvira comic, uh, yeah, I, had a, <laughs> I, I had a huge amount of time to work on it because it was the pandemic and it was pencils down and we did it as a Kickstarter. So we worked on this 40 page comic for six months and because we could. And so much more of it is Dave 
than it was when we were doing 20 pages a month for 12 months. You yeah. know what I mean? Because he had time to give me ideas and to say, hey, what if we do this? And he had so many great ideas. And even, you know, even the last pass I did on it uh, for pre-publication, I, I saw things. I was like, oh, I, that is a fantastic detail that I had not noticed before. Um, and like, is, there are some central ideas as an example, the, the 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 comics about uh, a plague that takes over Los Angeles because people use uh, a certain influential public pi figure uh, convinces people to ingest a cleaning product to fight <laughs> COVID, and they all turn all the people who do it turn into zombies. Mm -hmm. At the end, the leader of the zombie cult is doused with the cure for everyone, and after the thing was written and drawn, Dave said to me. Wouldn't it be great if he was actually not one of the zombies, if he just sprayed himself with to look like the rest of the zombies and wore contacts and he was a fraud the whole time? And we met and I went, it's not too late. <laughs> the colorist can make that work for me. You know, we can have the, the spray tan dripping off of him. I'll add a line. I've got a I've got a close up of Elvira where she was saying something else. I will have her say, oh, it's all fit, you know, like. We can we can change it, and that was made like literally a minute before we went to press. Uh, that was I I contacted the colorist. It was luckily on the last page, and said, "Uh, it's not his skin turning to normal. It's spray tan melting off his face from the cure." And they went, "Oh, great!" And uh, but if we had been on a tight schedule, we never would have that. Neither of us would have no. thought of it. But the time. As big a control for egomaniac as I am, that is far and away a better way to work. I want to hear yeah. every great idea Dave Acosta has every time. Yeah, and Dave was one of my artists when I was working at Dynamite. He did uh, the Vampirella Dune for Blood That's uh, right. crossover. Yeah, he's, he's great. He, he and I actually tried to do something based on one of my horror stories, but we could never get it. It was too dark. <laughs> it was too dark for any, even a dark horse to want to pick it up. It was just. Yeah. But maybe someday. But but I have a a uh, collaborative partner, a creative partner. None of our stuff has actually been published yet. Uh, his name's Craig Hamilton. Mm -hmm. uh, he got his start in the '80s doing Aquaman when he was like 19. Um, you know, in another case of someone who like got tossed, you know, into the deep end and had to learn how to do comics public. Uh, he did. Uh, he he started off with Aquaman. Um, and that was a controversial take. That was the the different costume. Yeah, that was the, the yeah. camouflage costume. Yes, the yeah. blue one. And he basically designed the costume for Ocean Master that you see in the movie. Yeah, that's from that miniseries, and so is that origin story. But you know, Neil Posner didn't get any credit, nor nor did Craig. Yeah, it's always the wild thing about working on IP that sits out there for 20, 30 years. Yeah. You know, I ha I didn't I didn't even make this connection. I wrote the first thing I ever got paid for was a Star Wars short story in which I had IG-88 fight Boba Fett. Mm -hmm. And a friend of mine who's a bigger Star Wars nerd than I did, um, point he's like the first episode of The Mandalorian has a guy in Mandalorian armor and an IG robot fighting each other. He's like, you think maybe someone looked at your short story from 30 Oh yeah, years Oh, yeah. Ago? yeah that's all grist for you the mills, where they're concerned. And yeah. I, Craig and I are working on a, uh, we were working on a uh, supposedly creator-owned comic last year that was a retelling of Frankenstein that went horribly wrong with the publisher, co-creator, co um, kind of went uh, Kurtz on us. Um, and we ended up, you know, basically having to flee a burning building. Um, and uh, that, yeah, the joys of uh, the joys of independent publishing nowadays. And you, know, you have people who want to be comic book publishers, but don't have the um, temperament or uh, to be businessmen. And this, it was like, it was like working for Trump. Yep. And, um, um, but we, he and I decided um, that we wanted to 
remain creative partners and st uh, for, uh, for basically for the rest of our creative lives. Um, and much like, and, and work on stuff much like uh, Elaine Lee and Mike Kaluta did with Starstruck and just do our own stuff. And right now we're, we're working on uh, a, uh, a independent uh, comic uh, graphic novel, I should say. It's not, you know, we're not even trying to figure it out as, as individual comics <coughs> um, about a um, lesbian mermaid pirate captain um, and her uh, crew, crew of uh, mythological characters sailing the, the, the Caribbean and the Seven Seas during uh, the, the 17th and 18th century. And that fantastic. Uh, oh yeah, and Craig's an amazing artist. Uh, like I said, he worked on fables for years. Mm -hmm. uh, Lucifer, uh, Spectre, Green Lantern. He did most of his work for uh, DC, I think. He did some other stuff here and there, but. For the most part, it, Starman. Um, and he's an incredibly detailed illustrator, uh, very much in the Mike Kaluta, uh, Phil, uh, Phil P. Craig Russell um, uh, spectrum. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with that that kind of art style, very Art Nouveau-ish or Art Deco designed, and um, although. Um, Craig, uh, we're, we're, we're kind of, we're right now, we're kind of like treading water right now because Craig, uh, um, had a horrible accident this past weekend and, uh, fractured his right ankle to the point where it was like this. When I went into the emergency room. Uh, there's a, uh, um, GoFundMe that I've got set up right now for him because it's going to be expensive because he has no health insurance. Of course, um, and um, he fractured his ankle so ba badly, he, he stepped off a curb and made the mistake of trying to correct himself. Mm. Yeah, you know, as they always say, you know, if you feel like you're going to fall, just tuck and roll. Don't try to stop yourself because it'll right. just make it worse. Where I'm just, I'm just thankful he didn't try to do that. Yes, yeah. not the hands. <laughs> yeah, and um, he's got two plates. Uh, three pins and 12 screws in his ankle now. Oh, God. And he's going to be, way. yeah, he's going to be bedridden for the next um, two weeks. Oh, well, probably the next two months, but it's going to be two weeks before they can take the cast off and see if it's healing properly. Right. And then he starts his physical therapy. Uh, he's probably not going to be walking unaided until sometime in the spring. But he's but he said, "Oh, well, this will this means I'll just have to draw it now." <laughs> <laughs> well, send us the. Uh, send us I'll, send you, I'll send you the link to the to it. To the GoFundMe, yeah. and we'll we'll definitely. Yes, it's, like I said, it's going to uh, be. We they, can, they had him in the hospital for almost five days before they worked on him. Ugh. Well, they're busy with the play. Yeah, the COVID stuff definitely. Basically, you want to know what the real you know COVID means that. At any moment, your surgical team could be dragged away to deal with something. Yep. Involving COVID, I watched someone die of it in the emergency room Yikes. last weekend. Um, While you were waiting for Craig? Yeah, no, I, Craig was already there. I had I was going to the bathroom, and it was at the end of the and they and they had the uh, the COVID people at the farthest end of the emergency room, and I had to walk past that to go to the bathroom. And she and she had to be younger than me, so uh, and I'm I'm 61, so she looked like she was in her 40s, maybe 50s. Yeah, it so, doesn't discriminate as much as people want to believe. No, it, no, no, it does not. It don't. It don't. It can't. My mother had polio, so you know it can't tell the different. You know diseases can't tell. Don't look at you. They don't have eyes. Right. Yeah, you know, all all they care about is whether they can replicate with inside you. Right. That's it. So, um, but I'll send you the link for the for the GoFundMe, and no, he's also got a a co a co buy me a coffee account, you know. <laughs> but but he's uh, he's doing he's home now. He's recovering. Um, um, we've had we've had people like uh, Neil Gaiman and. Uh, 
uh, Craig Russell, uh, Kim DeMolder, my old uh, inker from Swamp Thing, um, uh, Elaine Lee from Starstruck has reached out to us. Um, the, uh, Tom Mandrake and his wife, John, they've reached out to us. Um, uh, Shelly Bond with, at Black Crown. They've all, yeah. everyone, you know, yeah, everyone's awesome. been, you know, everyone's been really good about reaching out to us. Was um, Shelly around when you were doing uh, Swamp Thing? Yes, yeah, she was. Uh, she was uh, Shelly Rothsberger, I think. <laughs> with, um, Shelly was Rose, last, yeah. uh, That was her maiden name. And uh, when I knew her, she was um, an assistant editor to Karen. Yeah. And she was dating my good friend, uh, the late Lou uh, Stath uh, Stathis, rest in peace. Uh, who was my editor on the ill-fated Don Pierce series. Um, but I knew um, Lou back when he was an editor at High Times and Heavy Metal. Ah. And he's been gone a good 20 years now. But um, uh, but he had been, originally been my editor on Don Pierce, and when he died, Axel Alonzo took over. And Axel had been my assistant editor on Swamp Thing, so I knew Axel for for years too, um, and I've been friends with Neil for thirty years. Same with Steve Bissett. Uh, and it, it was very it, Bernie. Uh, uh, Bernie and I were really close for a while, um, and it, and it really meant a lot to me that Bernie took me under his his wing. Um, and he Will Eisner. Uh, he was like a. a Second grandfather to him, both him and Robert Block were like, you know, like Dutch grandpas to me. You know, they were, oh, they you were, were friends with Bob? Yes. Robert One of the and best I things Bob did was give me his blessings over the phone. Block and I were very close towards the end. He was a colleague. He was a, of my he, was a, he was a wonderful man. Yeah, he was a he was a lovely guy. Um, but I, <laughs> I won't tell the whole story because it's way too long. But <laughs> I was actually stabbed once by a psycho killer. Oh. And it was about two weeks after Robert Block had died. And yeah. one of my first thoughts in the ambulance was, oh, oh too bad he's Bob not here. I love he this does. story. He <laughs> loved it. I'm very sad I can't call up Robert Block and say, craziest thing happened to me. <laughs> Someone oh. took a carving knife in my back a couple of times. He would have yeah. seen the humor in it. <laughs> no, but, he, was, he was a wonderful man. He wants, he would, uh, I can say he was like a grandpa to me. Yeah. And him and Will, and um, you know they're 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 greatly missed. They're greatly missed. And I was also very close friends with Bell Close. Sure, I mean that brings back to to something we talk about a lot on this, which is uh, the it's a great community if you want to be a part of it, mm -hmm. and if you're willing to be a part of it, and if you're willing to give back to it. I mean, yeah. Bob wasn't particularly in the comic book community but he loved his funny books he yeah loved but he <laughs> there's one there's a hell on earth there's a graphic early graphic novel version of one of bob's short stories called mm -hmm. hell on earth that's very very good i feel like keith Giff, giffen drew it yeah I'm, that was that, byron price i think yeah it was byron price yeah Andy back when, back, yeah, back when that was pretty much the only place you could get a graphic novel they did yeah. some allison uh mm -hmm. back in the day but you know the, the, you know one of the reasons we do this thing, uh, and one of the things when I talk at cons about networking and you know the question everybody has about how to break in, I always say you know start with JFK. Ask not what comics can do for you, mm -hmm. <laughs> ask what you can do for comics. What well, one, yep. one thing one people always ask. What my my thing was when you got when this or well, this applies to back when we still had conventions. Yeah, and, and and I'm sure we will again. But I said, if you really want as a writer, because uh, basically conventions are set up for portfolio review. Mm -hmm. Like again, if you have to tap dance harder and faster if you're a writer to get their attention. And I said, when you go, uh, it, don't try and sh shove a bunch of just typewritten pages in front of them because at a convention, because that's not going to go anywhere. What you do is you go up there, you talk to them. And you ask them, "Can I go and get you a coffee?" Oh yeah. Or do you uh, do you want me to run to the bar and get you something? Uh, I, I can go over and get you some churros. You want some churros? And it, 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 so they don't have to like get up and. and yeah, that's very smart. That and I then, always 
I always joke about that at conventions that people stand online to get a signing, to meet somebody, to go to a panel. And I'm like, if you find the closest hotel bar to this convention and you go there after the convention ends, that person you had to wait on a three hour line to talk to is probably standing there perfectly happy to have them, you buy them a drink and you'll get yeah. at least five minutes of their time alone. <laughs> oh yeah, and, and basically, and, and then you say, do you have a card? Yeah. And, and, and the other thing, and then, then you can call them, but the other thing I tell them is never call them on a Monday. Wait till Tuesday or Wednesday because Monday is usually they're coming back from a convention and then they have to have their editorial meetings uh, uh, with you know, with everyone who wasn't at, at the conventions. So so wait till Wednesday to call them. That's very, very solid advice. So, but go, yeah, going back to what you were saying, I mean, giving back, you never know when someone you perceive to be below you on the food chain is going to be quickly above you. I mean, and, and it, it's not about quid pro quo. It's about just being part of a community and whether it's like giving advice or being responsive or, you know, sometimes people come up to me and want to do a portfolio review in the middle of the convention <clears> floor and you just, you do it. You never know who this person's going to be. Right. And it's just like, how would you like to be treated if you were in those shoes? Like, and we've all been there where we just need a few minutes of time to kind of progress, even if we don't get the gig, just to get advice and get some kind of feedback. It's And that sense of community is still, it still exists. I find Twitter, despite it being kind of a, a cesspool, can be very productive. I've made relationships on Twitter. I can, I've made friends that I just know on Twitter. I mean, David, we interact mainly on Twitter and Facebook yeah. and things like yeah. that. And sure. you network and you kind of, show that you're a functional citizen of you know the global community well, and the, go from there. <laughs> when, yeah, when I'm not crazy. It's a low bar now. When I, talk about, <laughs> when I talk about networking, I always say that there's a there is a fundamental thing that people must understood about networking. And then I know Alex has got to go. We got to wrap this up. He Sorry. has a plane to catch. He has a show in Vegas with Dean Martin. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. I'll be Steve Martin today. Yeah. But the, like, the, but the main thing I say is that what people get wrong about networking is the minute you approach it with money signs in your eyes, you've already lost. Yeah. yeah. Networking is, a, people always say it's who you know. And I always say, exactly. So here's what you do. Know people. <laughs> and how do you know them. people? You approach them as a them. friend. You approach Behind. them as a Behind. colleague. You approach them with a degree of familiarity with their work. And the number one thing I learned in Hollywood that adapts to comic books is you never talk to someone about their most popular thing that everybody loves. You find the passion project they did that everybody hates <laughs> or that failed, and you talk to them about that. Or even better, you talk to them about what they want to talk about. Yeah. You talk to them about, I always tell people, the first conversation I had with my future business partner, Kevin Eastman, was about 1970s World War II comics because it's a thing we both love. I don't yeah. know that we discussed the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles in the first year of knowing each other because it did not come up in conversation very much. And that's, you know, you don't talk to George, you don't talk to George Lucas, talk to him about radio days or, you know, Radio Land murders, not about Star Wars. <laughs> If you want to talk to Iggy Pop, talk about old car, old uh, Max Fleischer uh, cartoons or Terry Tunes. Exactly. It's like that's the what did they care about, and that's what did passion. they want to be have a conversation about, and not uh, doesn't matter how big the stars are in your eyes about the thing that they did that you love. You know, yeah, you treat you them like them. a human being. Don't treat yeah. them like a means to an end. That's and that's the problem. Is. A lot of times you get people that come up to you and they know, oh, this person is that and I'm going to use that. And the, you can people can see that a mile away. So the, just be a human. The, the reason I decided to do panels about networking at conventions is I was at Long Beach Comic Con and they had had a they had had a seminar about uh, networking. And an hour after that seminar, they had a cocktail party. And at that cocktail party, someone who had attended their networking se uh, thing walked up to me and handed me their comic book before saying hello. <laughs> and I was like, well, clearly that didn't take, or there yeah. was some missing information if you thought that was how to handle this interaction. Yeah, <laughs> yeah narcissists aren't gonna listen to you no matter what. Yeah, but exactly. But, but you're, you're saying about that was on the up, on the way down. Um, like I said, I've got something brewing in Hollywood I'm not allowed to talk about right now, mm -hmm. but it involves someone 
who, when they were 19 years old, sent me a fan letter. And I um, was apparently kind enough to um, respond. And they never forgot that. And now they're like a really hot uh, television and movie writer, screenwriter and showrunner. And I had that experience. And, they, and came and knocked on my door, but they, they might, theoretically, looking for some, looking to do something with me. That's great. Yeah, back when I was a production guy, a grip, there was a PA I was very nice to on a low budget Roger Corman movie. I didn't work for Corman for about five more months. And then I got a phone call and they were like, I have the head of production to talk to you. And I was like, sure, I'll take a call from the head of production at Concord. And it was the PA from five months ago. Uh, she was really <laughs> smart. <laughs> so within five months, she has gone from let me get you a coffee to uh, would yeah. you like me to hire you as key grip on this movie? And I was like, I uh, yeah, I, I once kicked a, this goon out of my fantasy football league, who is now a a very powerful executive at Warner Brothers. So oh, uh, uh, it, 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 it goes breaks both always. ways. Yeah. It goes both ways. Yeah, yeah. it breaks yeah. always. Uh, yeah, and I, so we should uh, we should probably wrap it up. Uh, yeah. uh, with that, right? Uh, I know Alex needs to get out of here. So why don't we uh, why don't we go around the loop here? Alex, we'll start with you, and we'll go that way. Sure. Uh, just uh, just remind us who you are. Uh, let us know what you're. Uh, you know, let us know what you got coming out. What's on the horizon? and uh, where we can find you online. Yeah, you can find me uh, at alexsegura.com or alex underscore segura at Twitter. Uh, I'm work I finished, just finished up a first draft of my next book, Secret Identity, which is the uh, comic book noir coming out from Flatiron. Um, I've got some other comic book stuff I can't really get into yet, but I'm excited to get that rolling. And uh, that's it. And Archie, I'm, I'm co-president at Archie, so everything right. Archie related is <laughs> yeah. somehow has my fingers on it to some degree. Nice. Nancy? Well, well I'm, I'm Nancy Collins. Uh, I'm a novelist and comic book writer. Uh, right now, what I have out um, the uh, is the Swamp Thing by Nancy A. Collins Omnibus, um, which you can get uh, at Amazon and being, uh, Barnes Noble and various other online places. It's a good thousand pages of my two-year nice. run on Swamp Thing with, with art by uh, Tom Mandrake, um, uh, let's, uh, Sean, now I'm gonna, uh, now I'm gonna completely blank on everything. So, Russ Braun, um, uh, Scott, Scott Eaton, uh, cover, you know, art by, uh, cover art by Charlie Vest. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's a, you can kill a man with this book. It's hard <laughs> cover. Kill a man with a lazy good. seven pounds. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, and, uh, right now I'm working on, um, the Adventures of Captain Finn, F-I-N-N, -N, the uh, lesbian mermaid pirate captain, uh, uh, and her um, rowdy, rowdy uh, mythological crewmates, uh, and uh, with my uh, partner in crime, um, Craig Hamilton, and there should be a link to his GoFundMe to help him with his shattered leg somewhere down there. Yes, um, yes. Um, yes. we will display it prominently. And it, and like all my and all our friends from Europe think we're idiots. Oh, he just got a he just and he just got a uh, uh, get well mate from Matt Ryan who plays Constantine on DC. You know, nice. I, 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 oh, my, my old friend Mark Verheiden. I've known Mark for forty years, and he uh, was the executive producer on Constantine. And I'd met Matt earlier this year before everything locked down, so. I got him to, and, and, and Craig was like delirious in the emergency room because they hadn't given me painkillers yet. And so I asked him, is there anything I can do for you? He goes, tell that Ryan to tell me to get better. <laughs> <laughs> okay, your that's wish funny. is my command. And that's, that, the, and his get well, his get well bait thing is from Constantine is posted on the Go, GoFundMe page. So that's great. there you go. Nice. <laughs> uh, I'm going to make mine nice and short davidavalonefreelance.com it's all there all the links to all of the things my work this year has mostly been uh, stuff on Kickstarter but I'll be soliciting some new stuff uh, I might be next, doing something yeah um, in the next couple of too, yeah. in the next month or so a lot of opportunity on Kickstarter these days and Ryland 
Uh, I am Ryland Grant, at Ryland Grant on all forms of social media, R-Y-L-E-N-D-G-R-A-N-T. I always spell it because it's not a real name. My parents drunkenly arranged letters and saddled me with it. So uh, uh, there it is. Um, the Ringo Award uh, winning aberrant and the four-time Ringo Award nominated Banjax are available in fine comic shops everywhere, as well as on Amazon and Comixology and all that good news. Uh, speaking of Kickstarter, uh, The Jump. And my latest and greatest, the Peacekeepers, uh, they are available via backer kit right now uh, in the wake of uh, a couple of kind of cool and fun uh, Kickstarter campaigns. So check those out. Um, I don't know if we could talk about it just yet. Um, I think Alex is going to announce it uh, next month. But uh, my, I, I did a, a Archie meets uh, Bubbles from the Wire uh, one shot that should be premiering sometime <laughs> uh, uh, middle of next year. Um, it's a great yeah. comic book, mad, madcap fun. Uh, so, so look out for that, of course. And um, and yeah, my uh, uh, you know my movie uh, that was shot, you know, in the middle of this COVID uh, craziness is being edited right now. I'm very excited. Congrats! Uh, see that uh, on the festival circuit next year. So, um, uh, starring Emil Hirsch and all that uh, that good noise. Shot under an active volcano in uh, <laughs> uh, in South America. Incredible. Um, but yes, yeah, that's. Uh, as one does, uh, particularly in the middle of a <laughs> pandemic. Um, but yeah, so that's uh, that's me. Uh, thank you guys so much for coming on. Let's thanks, uh, guys. Let's this was really great. And thanks so much for having for us. Watching. Yeah, this was great. Yeah, yeah, thanks for watching. Must thanks actually, for listening. Actually, see you in the flesh. So, to speak. <laughs> so yeah, uh, see you guys at the con in about five out. years. <laughs> <laughs> Happy thanks, trails. Guys. Take it easy, y'all. Thanks. If you're watching us on YouTube, be sure to smash that like button. If you're listening to us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or other fine purveyors of ear crack, please leave us a five-star review. And wherever you're watching and or listening, subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. We'll see you back here next week for more Madcap Hijinks on the Writer's Block. <laughs>